thought they probably invite you uh, to the two week international faculty development program on advanced computational and experimental research in physics day 4 session 5 srm institute of science and technology is one of the top ranking universities in india over 20000 students and 1500 faculty offering a wide range of undergraduate post graduate and doctoral programs in engineering management medicine and health sciences and science and humanities foreign faculty flexible and dynamic curriculum exciting research and global connections are the features that set xrm apart students have a wide choice of cutting edge programs including nanotechnology bioinformatics genetic engineering remote sensing and gis embedded systems or computer forensics to choose from most of these courses are offered in close collaboration with foreign universities with this uh, small introduction i would like to invite uh, dr a nadraj my colleague to deliver welcome address yeah thank you sir uh, yeah so today is the fourth day of fdp the two week fdp so the main motto that uh, objective of that fdp is to enrich the knowledge of faculties through interaction with the eminent personality like uh, uh, professor maxim sir uh, to that the knowledge sharing will improve the teaching learning process to the student on behalf of that society it, it is that uh, it gives me the great pleasure to welcome Uh, all of you for the fourth day of fdp on advanced computational and experimental uh, research in physics on behalf of the srm isc i welcome our today's chief guest uh, today's uh, speaker uh, dr maxmi champano sir uh, who is the post doc researcher at the institute of applied physics fredrik schiller university jena uh, germany so he is going to deliver our uh, is uh, talk in the in title that is the volume laser silicon the interactions uh, we are uh, grateful we are grateful to him for accepting our invite invitation to share his knowledge as the chief guest uh, at the uh, last i i would like to welcome all all the uh, young researcher teacher all the student uh, present here to make this event worthwhile sir i am uh, we are all very happy to hear you to uh, hear the talk sir i will welcome sir thank you very much for your kind introduction yeah yeah with with that uh, with that i want to introduce that uh, uh, today speaker uh, professor maxim champano sir Uh, i want to share uh, some of his uh, credential to you he is the post doc researcher he is uh, working in the uh, the institute of applied physics at friedrich schiller university jena germany uh, professor maximi uh, received his uh, doctoral degree at axis marcelle university france in the year of 2014 under the supervision of laren lamai neri Uh, Lomi, Dechartu, and uh, Jean Ubc Natoli. His uh, uh, area of research include uh, photonics, optics, and laser optics and photonics, material characterization, semiconductor device physics, laser material, uh, nonlinear optics. He is also worked as the postdoctoral researcher at the LP3 uh, laboratory in Marseille, France. from uh, 2015 to 18 under the supervision of david crojo from uh, crojo from the 2018 he is the post doctoral researcher at the institute of applied physics in jena uh, germany under the supervision of stephen nolte uh, he has published more than 60 research paper in the international journal with that credential we are very happy to uh, uh, hear 
hear uh, your thoughts, sir. So, with that credential, I invite hand over the session to Professor Maximi, sir. Please take over the session, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Can you all see my screen and, uh, yeah, and hear to, me? Yeah, you be able to see the screen and be able to hear, sir. All right, fantastic. So normally, yeah, great. So thank you again for your very kind introduction and good afternoon, everyone. For me, it's still morning here in, in Germany. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I would like to thank the organization committee for, uh, for inviting me to, to this, uh, this session and giving me the opportunity to present you our latest results uh, in the field of laser matter interaction and especially um, laser silicon interaction. Um, whoops, sorry. Uh, so maybe you have seen the talk from my colleague Alessandro Alberucci yesterday, uh, which was a... Sorry. Not, not the, you can continue, sir. You can okay, continue. Okay, okay. Sure. Uh, so, so the talk of Alessandro Alberucci was uh, mainly a general talk, very nice talk, uh, but quite general on the possibilities offered by ultrafast optics and ultra short pulses in general, uh, namely in the femtosecond and picosecond regime. Um, here today, uh, I'm gonna speak about in-volume laser silicon interaction. So this is a more specific topic which covers a actually a lot of uh, a lot of fields, uh, especially in uh, well solid state matter, laser matter interaction, and so on. Uh, so as it was said, my name is Maxime Chambonneau, uh, working at the Institute of Applied Physics in Jena, Germany. Uh, the outline of my talk would be uh, quite straightforward, I would say. So first, I will uh, I will introduce the context concerning ultrafast laser silicon interaction. What are the ins and the outs, and what uh, what can be achieved with with uh, with ultra short lasers in in silicon? And then I will focus on uh, focus on some. Uh, some recent applications we have developed here in Jena, Germany. Uh, first of all, uh, I will try to get my pointer. Yeah, normally you can see it. Uh, so first of all, I will speak about optical functionalization of silicon with picosecond pulses. So uh, essentially, this is uh, uh, writing waveguides and uh, optical elements inside uh, inside the material. Second, I will uh, speak about uh, semiconductor to metal ultrafast laser welding, which was a, a technique we have developed this year. And uh, I will end my talk by speaking about uh, wafer dicing, silicon wafer dicing, and uh, what can be achieved with, uh, with ultrafast uh, or ultra short laser pulses for um, separating a whole wafer into individual chips. So first of all, let's introduce the context uh, concerning ultrafast laser silicon interaction. So uh, as you may know, ultrafast lasers represent an extraordinary tool for functionalizing dielectric materials, uh, especially glasses, but also polymers. And the reason is contained here on the left, um, because at those ultra short time scales, it is possible to first deliver energy to the electron subsystem, and then the, this energy will be released well after to the lattice. And this allows uh, so, so you have a clear separation between the causes, which are the energy deposition 
from the consequences which are the material response. And it is possible to induce different, uh, different types of modifications. I will not go into the details, but usually in dielectrics, you can produce uh, some positive refractive index changes or nanogratings or also some voids when you increase the, the energy, the incoming uh, pulse energy. So um, this has a lot of applications for functionalizing transparent materials and especially uh, some applications are shown here on the right for fiber optics, microfluidics, data storage, micromechanics, quantum computing, additive manufacturing, and surgery, especially eye surgery. So the question now is, is it easy to transfer the whole knowledge about laser dielectric interaction to silicon and basically do the same? Well, sadly, the answer is no. And there are two main reasons for that. Uh, first, there are some technological difficulties, especially if you want to functionalize uh, in volume silicon wafers. Uh, as you can see here, silicon is not transparent to visible light, so you will need infrared ultra-fast ultra uh, laser sources. Moreover, you will probably need some optics and detectors which are more costly and also less efficient in the IR uh, compared to, to the visible. For instance, uh, in terms of performance, here I give you an, an example. Uh, concerning the pixel size of your smartphone, which is on the order of one micron. And for the best IR cameras, uh, like in-gas cameras, they are more on the order of uh, 10 micron. But if it was only technical details and technological issues, then it would still be possible to, to modify the bulk of silicon with ultra short laser pulses. No, the, the main problem here uh, comes from physical limitations and this uh, becomes much more interesting for us, especially when you take a look at the nonlinear refractive index of silicon, it is about 100 times higher than the one of Fusilica, which is the typical dielectric material on which uh, a lot of studies have been, uh, have been done. And then this uh, high nonlinear refractive index provokes a lot of um, optical and physical phenomena, especially uh, a competition occurs between care effect on the one hand which is shown here uh, in blue. And it is balanced by plasma defocusing shown here on the right. So uh, basically, care effect will have the consequence of a self collapse of the beam, theoretically to a single point. However, um, when the when the beam is focused inside the material uh, with a very tight, uh, tight beam size, uh, a plasma will be formed. So you ionize the material. And this ionization results in plasma defocusing phenomenon. So you create a population of uh, free electrons inside the material, and this will defocus the beam. So in the end, you will have those focusing and defocusing dynamics uh, near the, the focus, the hypothetical focus, at least. Um, so this is what we call filamentation, which is a highly nonlinear propagation um, regime. And this uh, filamentation regime has two major consequences. First of all, uh, there will be a nonlinear focal shift, as you can see here uh, on the bottom left 
like for uh, low pulse energies, the beam is focused here. And then when you increase the energy, the focus shift upstream the laser. Second consequence is a saturation of the intensity inside the bulk, which is shown here on the right. So you, when you increase the energy, well, the, the, the laser fluence, so the, the, the real deposited energy inside silicon is limited and saturated. And when you take those two consequences together, well, uh, you can conclude that there is delocalization uh, of the energy deposition to the prefocal region. And a consequence of this is that increasing the la laser energy will be a bad strategy for hoping to modify silicon. So why should we aim at extending uh, 3D ultrafast laser inscription to silicon? Well, first, because as you may know, silicon is the backbone of constantly growing markets, including quantum technologies, silicon photonics, ultrafast microelectronics, sensors, photovoltaics, and so on. This is shown here. This is growing more and more with time. To date, high precision lithography methods such as SOI, so silicon on insulator, are traditionally used for fabricating silicon based devices, but those methods usually show important drawbacks as they are limited to a 2D architecture, or if you want to build 3D, then you have to proceed layer by layer. You need a clean environment. It is time consuming and also costly. Yeah. On the other hand, laser direct writing has the potential to be 3D, flexible, fast, and contactless. So a pretty agile method for functionalizing the material. To date, um, for laser silicon interaction, <clears throat> especially, nanosecond laser pulses can be used and they allow addressing some applications. As you can see here, uh, there is a binary image of the Mona Lisa from Leonardo da Vinci. And this is what can be written uh, inside silicon. And this is the resulting hologram uh, written by nanosecond laser pulses. Uh, well, the, the main problem uh, for nanosecond laser pulses is that the degree of control is somehow limited by the heat and uh, the interaction more generally is uh, thermally driven. So uh, I would move to my first topic, uh, which is the inscription of low loss waveguides with picosecond pulses, so the optical functionalization of the material. And this study was mainly motivated by the following question. Uh, first, is it possible to write low loss waveguides inside silicon with picosecond laser pulses? We have seen previously that uh, in the, the previous section that uh, it is quite challenging, but can we find some ways to, to bypass the, the physical limitations? Then if it is possible, what is the refractive index change? And third, what is the origin of the wave guiding? So we'll try to answer all those three questions. So for inscribing waveguides inside silicon, we have developed uh, the following arrangement, experimental arrangement, relying on, on um, pulses at 1.55 micron wavelength, 800 femtosecond pulse duration, and uh, a few tens of microjoule in terms of uh, maximum input pulse energy. Then we adjust the the input pulse energy by means of a half wave plate and a polarizer. So this is controlled optically. Uh, similar 
the the beam size is uh, is controlled optically by means of telescopes galilean telescopes in that case before the beam is focused to the the wafer so the the sample the silicon sample by means of an objective lens this objective lens is also part of a, a microscope working uh, re, uh, in transmission, as shown here, uh, relying on uh, here represented in green, uh, this light, which allows us to to, to, to take images of the, the, the interaction and monitor the interaction in the X, Y plane, where Z is often called the optical axis. So here we are perpendicular to, to Z. Besides, we have another microscope relying on white light emission and objective lens and uh, an infrared camera. So we can see th through silicon and monitor the interaction in the, in the XZ plane. So what is the, so you, you can see here a typical inscription uh, where the bright part corresponds to the, the current laser focus. So what, uh, what is the trick we have found for, for inscribing waveguides inside silicon? Well, we start by damaging the exit surface of the sample, so creating a crater on the exit surface of the material, and then move upstream towards the, the laser, uh, at a constant speed here, typically it's 20 micron per second and uh, a few hundreds or on the order of 100 nanojoules for input pulse energy. And then you can propagate uh, and extend this crater, but you you produce some you, you produce some strain and permanent modification inside the material by doing so. Besides, we have another arrangement, which is ex situ for waveguide characterization. And this relies on basically continuous light emission at 1.55 micron, which is then focused in the waveguides. So here you can see it's focused to the waveguides. And, uh, and then we, we characterize the the light propagation inside the, the lines we have written. Uh, first, in transmission, as you can see here, we have an infrared microscope, which enables us to, to retrieve near-field images. And besides, we have a, another transverse microscope, which allows us to get, well, some um, scattered light images. So with this, we have measured uh, single mode uh, waveguides with a coupling efficiency of around 53% and a transmitted power, which is around 25%, which is consistent with uh, scattering images, like the near field images and all the measurements in transmission are quite consistent with the scattering images. It is also possible to not limit ourselves to waveguides, but also uh, to Y splitters, which are often called multiplexers. So the idea here is to inject light inside a waveguide and then have two other branches. So the, the light is split. It is split in twice. <clears throat> Uh, here you, you can see here on, on this figure on the right uh, that, uh, that we have a 50-50 white splitter, which is actually an additional proof of light guiding. And the damping losses are on the order of 4.5 dB per millimeter. Mm -hmm. Then we will want to characterize the refractive index change of the material. Like normally, if you can inscribe some waveguide, it means that you have uh, a refractive index change, which should be positive most of the time for gradient index optics. 
And to characterize the refractive index change, we, we rely first on Helmholtz equation shown here, uh, which allows us to, to do some uh, simulations of the light that we should theoretically detect. Um, could you please mute yourself? Yeah, yeah. no, no. Uh, it's some, some unknown. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, you can continue, sir. Sir, ask, sir, uh, you unmuted yourself, sir. So you are muted. Yes, now you can hear yeah, me, I guess. Yeah, yes. Great, great, great. Thank you. So, um, so the, this method that I described previously relying on inverse Helmholtz equation is, uh, is pretty classical. Uh, when you take a look at the literature, it's known from the 90s. And besides, we have developed together with my colleague Alessandro Alberucci in this reference, reference three, uh, another alternative method relying on the overlap integral coupled to a beam propagation method. And with the positioning system we have, which is a piezoelectric stage, we, we could take some different images when we shift the waveguide uh, with respect to the incoming light and then perform the same simulations. And as you can see, it's, <clears throat> it's working pretty well on this figure. So yeah. both methods we have employed uh, rely, well, allow us to conclude that the waveguides are W-shaped with a maximum refractive index around two times 10 to the minus three, which is in very good agreement with highly confined mode fields. All right, um, then one question is, what would be the origin of the, the wave guiding? So to answer this, we relied on nano characterization, nanoscale characterizations, especially with TM, so transmission electron microscopy. And as you can see here, it is possible to image uh, some defects, some nano defects along the waveguide track. Okay, what now about electron diffraction? Well, this we, we have carried out. And uh, as you can see here, there is no drastic change in the uh, crystal structure. So the crystal structure is maintained, but still we see under bright light TM uh, that there are some defects. So finally, we have uh, carried out recently uh, some annealing experiments uh, as you can see here. So I will not go to the detail, but the main conclusions of, of those experiments are when you increase the annealing temperature, well, the waveguide's properties are degraded, uh, namely the, the mode field diameter increases, as you can see here on the right, and the refractive index change decreases. So our conclusion is that the waveguides we have written rely on strain induced by dislocations. So here is the take home message for that part. Uh, with surface CD inscription, we could write low loss single mode waveguides with picosecond pulses as well as Y splitter uh, with a positive refractive index change higher than 10 to the minus three. And the written waveguides rely on strain induced by dislocations in the monocrystalline material. So now I will move to my second topic, second application, sorry, which is a semiconductor to metal ultrafast laser welding. So uh, here I will take the industrial point of view where joining materials is something essential if you want to build complex devices. Well, if you want to do so, then you might use or consider traditional methods such as adhesive bonding, for instance, like using glue to bond 
those two materials. But those methods usually show some, some important drawbacks. They may, for instance, uh, require another material or pressure assistance, or they may show some aging or degasing problems, or more often they, they may be not resistant enough to high temperatures, which can be a huge problem. Um, then an alternative was developed to solve this problem, which is called laser welding, which consists of energy deposition at the interface between two materials as uh, illustrated here. And this provides a fast, clean and contactless way to join those two materials. This was shown to be applicable in many material configurations such as glass to glass, glass to semiconductor, glass to metal, polymer to polymer, and more recently, ceramic to ceramic. <laughs> However, in the semiconductor to metal configuration, there is nothing too convincing so far. So let us have a try. To do so, we will use the following setup illustrated here. And uh, we will use uh, silicon and copper for, uh, for illustrating semiconductor to metal laser welding. So here, uh, basically, the setup is essentially the same, like one laser, one target, and uh, some diagnostics. Here, concerning the, the laser, uh, the laser pulses are around 10 picosecond duration at the same wavelength, so 1.55 micron wavelength, for which silicon is highly transparent, then we classically adjust the input pulse energy by means of a half-wave plate and a polarizer before the beam is focused to, to the interface between silicon and copper by means of an objective lens. And this objective lens is also used for a similar uh, microscope shown here, which allows us to do, so this works in, in dark field and we can basically acquire some images, some dark field images, as you can see here, and position uh, the focus, the hypothetical focus with respect to the surface. Um, then we evaluate the bonding quality ex situ by separating the two samples with an indenter. So let us have a try. If we set the input pulse energy to 300 nanojoule, then we are able to measure a shear joining strength of around 30 kilopascal. Okay, good to know. Then what if we double the energy, like go to 600 nanojoules? Then the shear joining strength is lower. It's 10 kilopascal. So this behavior is quite surprising, but the main question is, is that sufficient for envisioning some industrial applications. And sadly, the answer is no, as in that case, the samples are easily separable by hand. Moreover, the typical values for other material configurations or traditional bonding methods are on the order of one to 20 megapascal. So why, how can we explain this? Well, I gave the answer in the beginning of my talk, actually, everything comes from filamentation, which is what we will demonstrate in the, the next slides. So those focusing and defocusing dynamics represented here, provoking both an intensity clamping, so a saturation of the energy deposition, and at uh, the same time, some nonlinear focal shift. So here are the solutions we, we propose well, first, in the frame of semiconductor to metal laser welding, we will use an interface with a metal, not only pure silicon, meaning that the absorption should be drastically increased. And moreover, we propose a filament relocation at the interface, um, meaning that theoretically the intensity, uh, the laser intensity should be increased. But to do so, we need for nonlinear propagation imaging. And this is actually what we did with the following setup, which is nothing else than 
an inverted microscope working in, in transmission. And this allows us to, to retrieve those uh, nonlinear propagation images. So the 3D fluence distribution inside silicon. And moreover, with this kind of data, we are able to measure the nonlinear focal shift as a function of the energy, which is depicted here at the bottom. So here on this data on the right, one can distinguish three different regimes. The first one is at very low input pulse energy, the linear propagation regime, which was somehow confirmed by uh, some simulations that we, that we carried out with the model uh, which was developed recently by my colleague, Ching Fung Li, which is open source and thus open access. Uh, and if you are interested in doing these kind of simulations, please feel free to, to, to note those two references. This might be useful for many applications, actually. Then for intermediate uh, input pulse energies, so back to those data here on the right, between 10 and 100 nanojoules, one can see that the focus becomes an ambiguously shifted upstream, the laser. However, the shape and the overall shape, I would say, is conserved. And then the final regime is when you increase a lot the energy and go to more than 300 nanojoules. And then one can see the, that we are in the filamentation regime, especially here for one microjoule. Uh, where you see those focusing and defocusing dynamics. So the conclusion of, of this is that when you increase the input pulse energy, the energy deposition will be far from the interface, which is in very good agreement with a semi-analytical model that we have developed, uh, which is represented by the solid lines here on this graph. So, okay, so now that we know the reasons for the nonlinear focal shift, and we have characterized the, 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 the evolution of this nonlinear focal shift as a function of the input pulse energy. Let us try to push a little bit the limits. Um, here on the on the left, you can see that the it is represented the shear joining strength uh, as a function of the input pulse energy, so for two input pulse energies actually, without in red and with in green nonlinear focal shift precompensation. And it is pretty clear from this figure here on the left that precompensating the nonlinear focal shift delta z leads to a much better welding. Okay, so what now if we decide to increase the energy even more, but at the same time, precompensate the nonlinear focal shift delta Z. Well, the results are essentially shown here on the right with those blue points. And one can see that it is possible to reach a megapascal, like more than two megapascal shear joining strength uh, with this strategy for around one microjoule uh, input pulse energy. And this value of more than two megapascal is suitable for applications. Interestingly, um, there is one can note that there is no welding possible for input pulse energies below 100 nanojoules, meaning that silicon to copper ultrafast laser welding is solely achievable in the filamentation regime, which justifies completely uh, our approach of measuring and precompensating the nonlinear focal shift. Besides, here on the top, one can see that for uh, one can see the evolution of the maximum fluence reaching the interface, as well as the energy deposited uh, at this interface, or the energy reaching this interface. Uh, as a function of the input pulse energy. And one can here again see that precompensating the nonlinear focal shift leads to enhanced energy deposition. So here, here is the take home message for this, this part. Uh, so first we have 
achieve the very first semiconductor to metal ultrafast laser welding by characterizing picosecond laser induced filaments inside silicon. We have measured megapascal shear joining strength that is compatible with applications. And if you are interested in, in this topic, please feel free to scan this QR code here, which will lead you to our latest paper on, on this topic published in lasers and laser and photonics reviews. Then I will move to the last application, so the last part of my talk, which is entitled Laying the Foundations of Ultrafast Laser Dicing. So here again, the motivations are quite simple. Uh, we wanted to answer the following questions. First, is there really no way to modify silicon with femtosecond pulses, like without the help of an interface with another material or by producing a crater? So solidly in the bulk. Second, if yes, is ultrafast transverse inscription possible? And third, is it possible to induce some weakening uh, inside the material, so some weak points that can act as uh, a precursor for dicing a whole wafer into individual chips. So to answer the, all those questions, we have developed the following arrangement, which is essentially the same as previously in terms of optics and techniques we have used, so I will not describe it, uh, describe it again. However, we have uh, chosen different laser parameters that are interesting. First, we will use a laser wavelength around 2 micron, not uh, as previously 1.55 micron. Why? Uh, well, the answer is contained here according to nonlinear propagation stimulations. Uh, one can see that around 2 micron, there is an enhancement of the energy deposition inside the bulk of silicon. So this is a specific wavelength for laser silicon interaction. Second, we have used sub picosecond pulses, so femtosecond pulses, but that time with um, distorted pulses. As you can see here, the autocorrelation trace. Uh, one can see that there are a few bumps inside the temporal profile, which can be explained by some satellite pulses near the main peak. And third, we have used a spatial optimization, which consists of counterbalancing the aberrations provoked by the spherical lens shown here, uh to so counterbalancing those aberrations with the aberrations inevitably provoked by the air to silicon interface and by doing some calculations with the previous um, the previous model that the from from my colleague ching fung li which is called in focus we were able to to conclude that around 100 micron focusing depth, there, there should be some precompensation of, uh, of spherical aberrations, meaning that the intensity should be maximum near this, uh, this position, this focus position. OK, so what about the, the experiments? So we have carried out sim single pulse irradiations. And here are the results in terms of uh, modification or damage probability in the bulk of silicon as a function of the focusing lens, uh, the, the focusing depth, sorry. Uh, one can see that uh, it is absolutely non-monotonic and it is possible to, to see that it is, one can reach 100% damage probability inside the bulk of silicon, so repeatable modifications at focusing depth around 100 to 120 uh, micron. And uh, of course, the, you, you need some sufficient uh, input pulse energy, so higher than 1.9 microjoule. 
So this window behavior shown here is, was extremely consistent with a nonlinear propagation model, uh, which is developed by my colleagues that I will acknowledge uh, in the at the end of my talk. Um, meaning, so, and by performing those nonlinear propagation simulations, we were able to see that around 100 micron focusing depth, both the theoretical peak intensity as well as the peak electron density should be enhanced compared to other uh, focusing depth. Finally, we have characterized the modifications uh, by different means. So my, like uh, shadow graphy, as you can see here, and also uh, in infrared interferometry, which allow us to conclude that the modifications that we produced are uh, they, they consist of micro bubbles inside the material with a positive refractive index change. Okay, so let's try to uh, to push again a little bit the limits. And what happens uh, when when one moves the sample with respect to the incoming light? So here are the results shown uh, on the left. So it is uh, here I show you that it is possible to do some transverse writing inside silicon. Uh, and the line morphology uh, can be discrete, steady, or erratic, mainly depending on the writing speed. So here the, the input pulse energy is constant at 2.5 microjoule. And we repeated this kind of experiments. Uh, at different input pulse energies. Uh, so here is the, the input pulse energy on this axis, uh, the writing speed, the black points represent some tested uh, configurations, uh, which allow us to discriminate different domains for the line morphology. And one can see that it is possible to write continuous lines transversely uh, only when the modification probability is higher than 100%. Uh, or, well, not higher, but equal to 100%, of course. Uh, this means that transverse line inscription inside silicon is intimately uh, correlated with, the, with intrinsic breakdown and intrinsic damage production inside the material. And then my colleague, Markus Blote, uh, has carried out recently some three-point breaking tests. So the idea here is to inscribe lines transversely inside wafers and then apply a pressure to the wafer. And uh, one can see that from this is illustrated here in, on this figure uh, on the bottom that lines, the, the transversely written lines can act as weak points inside the material. And when a force is applied, the breakage, the cleaving of the wafer is guided. Uh, in comparison, when the wafer is not modified, one can see that if you apply uh, some pressure on the wafer, then it is destroyed in thousand pieces. So here is the take home message for this last part. Uh, by using a triple optimization in the spatial, temporal, and spectral domain, we were able to produce uh, some repeatable single pulse modifications. We have also achieved the very first transversely written lines inside silicon with femtosecond laser pulses. And those lines can be used for wafer dicing applications. So to summarize, um, as, you, as we have seen, in volume laser direct writing inside silicon is usually limited by filamentation, which prevents the production of permanent modifications inside the material. However, if one uses exit surface seeds, like crater production at the exit surface of the sample, it is possible to perform uh, inscription, laser inscription of low loss waveguides and multiplexers inside the material. 
Then by taming the filamentation, so measuring and precompensating the nonlinear focal shift, it is possible to carry out some semiconductor to metal ultrafast laser welding, which offers a new avenue for manufacturing and especially additive manufacturing. Then uh, last but not least, we have seen that uh, a space-time spectrum optimization leads to uh, new applications concerning wafer dicing. So this could profoundly modify the way the wafers are diced into individual chips currently. Before thanking you, I would like to acknowledge uh, people actually all around the world in different institutions, both in academia and uh, industrial partners. Uh, first in my group, the group of Professor Stefan Note. Uh, so my intern, Namig, uh, my colleagues, Alessandro, uh, Marcus, Jisha, Helena, uh, Chingfung, and so on. And uh, I would like to also thank the group of Jens Simpert, same institute, so Institute of Applied Physics in Jena, Germany, uh, especially Martin and Tobias, uh, my colleagues who carried out nonlinear propagation simulations, who guide us for the experiments, so the group of uh, Professor Stelios Tsortakis and uh, Vladimir Fedorov, for instance, uh, for especially, I mean. Uh, people at Leibniz Institute, Kai and Martin, people in the, in the geo, geoscience, the, the group of uh, Professor Langenhorst, and then uh, people in the industry, uh, so mainly laser manufacturers, uh, Florian Sotiev and Stephanie Tertelman from Inolas Photonics, as well as uh, people in active fiber systems, uh, which is a company in Germany. Both are companies in Germany. Active Fiber Systems is also uh, from Vienna. And uh, I would like to thank Christian Gaida for that. So before ending my talk, I would like to tell you that if you need more information, please feel free to scan this QR code here on the right, which will lead you to our uh, latest works on laser to silicon interaction and even more actually. Everything is open access and uh, you can contact me uh, directly on, uh, on ResearchGate or alternatively you can directly contact me by email at, uh, at the following address. So I would like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Maximi. Uh, for delivering a wonderful talk and uh, your presentation was so colorful and was very fabulous and really all the participants okay, uh, we, are, we are gifted to hear your lecture so very good lecture very we have enjoyed a lot thank you thank, thank you. you dr maxine thank you uh, yes sir uh, so it is in the evening in india so we are uh, very happy to uh, listen your talk so it is very informative the participants who have attended really enjoyed uh, your presentation and also it gives a clear knowledge about that uh, silica uh, laser interaction uh, how it overcome the conventional method or conventional drawbacks or limitations you clearly explained that was very useful to for the participants or the young researcher or participated in that uh, event we appreciate you making time in your busy schedule to accept to share the session on this event. Thank you, sir. It is, uh, uh, we are all very happy to uh, listen to your uh, talk, sir. Thank, Audience, thank you very much. Yeah, please, uh, uh, participants. So, please, if you have a uh, query, so please unmute it yourself, ask. Otherwise, you put your question in the chat box. Participants, uh, the chat box is enabled now, so you can type your question, or you can you can unmute yourself and you can ask the question. Yeah. 
here participants you can ask the question related to this talk we also got a good comment from the chat box also it is the internet use session very nice and wonderful presentation so thank you thank you all thank you then if anything is not clear just feel free to contact me at my email address or if you have any more questions that's no uh, problem we will share the, your email address professor and then if any anything <clears throat> sir one one question uh, just now i noticed in the chat box uh mr kannan he asked uh, in monocrystalline material we observe dislocation how how can we rectify sir dr maximi yeah. can, can you find a question yeah, in monocrystalline material we observed dislocation how we can rectify by uh, mr p kannan um i'm not sure i understand uh, the question i will try to give an answer i hope it is right um so in monocrystalline material when you have some sufficient uh, energy deposition it is possible to make the crystal planes slide above uh, each other which is dislocation so the the monocrystalline material is i mean the material is still monocrystal however uh, there is some strain which is uh, which is produced by this slide slide up from uh, one crystal plane to another there yeah, one no. more question from yen radia if the if the refractive index is changed what changes is occur in the wave gate Well, <clears throat> if you want to to guide light inside a material, so what is a waveguide first? The waveguide is nothing else than a counterbalance of diffraction, especially normally when you focus uh, the beam at the enter of a wafer, it diverges at some point. And the waveguide prevents this divergence of the of the beam. So to do so, uh usually for laser written waveguides and waveguides more generally <clears throat> um it is uh, possible to induce some refractive index change which will so so you have a positive refractive index change channel uh and the surrounding material is the 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 refractive index of of silicon actually so the the intrinsic refractive index and then with this channel at, at the border of this channel uh, there will have some total internal refraction and uh, and this leads actually to to the the waveguide effect so normally for having waveguides uh, you need a few 10 to the minus 4 or ideally one um, 10 to the minus 3 in terms of refractive index change, and then you have a quite nice waveguide. Thank you, sir. Uh, one more question from the Saukert to uh, Sir, this work can help to give result on 2D material via computation, like band structure, density of state, likewise they are asked. He is asked. So, it is not too straightforward. It's uh, really another field, as far as I know. I'm really not an expert in, in 2D materials like graphene and so on. Um, I guess it will be hard to compare uh, the band structure of silicon with some calculations of the band structure in 2D materials. Yeah, any other question? Uh, participants, if you have any question, so please unmute it yourself and ask. Okay, 
uh, thank you sir now i request uh, dr jalakshmi madam to deliver a vote of thanks yes sir thank you sir so it is my privilege to propose vote of thanks for the fourth day fourth day session 5 of two week international faculty development program and advanced computational and experimental research in physics 2021 organized by department of physics SRM Institute of Science and Technology Ramavaram campus Chennai first of all i extend my sincere thanks to our chairman for his encouragement and support to conduct this two week fdp i extend my warm thanks to our resource person dr maxim postdoc researcher frederick schiller university chennai germany who gave scintillating talk on involving laser silicon interaction and enlightened us with his talk thank you sir i extend my sincere thanks to our director ramavaram and trichy campus for perfect support and guidance extended to us for conducting this fdp my sincere thanks to our dean ent ramavaram campus for his valuable support i thank our vp academic vp admin for their encouragement for this conduction of fdp i thank all the faculty members research scholars for their continuous support last but not least i am very much thankful to all the participants who have attended today's session thank you all thank you thank you dr maxmi thank you thank you very much thank you all thank you thank you, uh, you, you maxmi sir right. thank you professor thank you it was my privilege thank you thank you yeah, bye should should i leave now yeah 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 you can leave sir. all right thank you thank you thank you yeah hope to see you soon yeah sure bye <laughs> thank you thank you sir. welcome to india professor <laughs> i hope so one day <laughs> <laughs> definitely <laughs> okay. thanks a lot bye bye bye, bye.